so yeah, I'd like to, to share with you, you know, some things we did in the last few years on, on topic involving machine learning for discrete objects. And so I will focus mostly on permutations, rankings, and discuss a bit some, you know, some ways to, to deal with this data uh, in the, let's say, modern machine learning way, which is to try to do optimization, for example, uh, with, with gradients when you have such uh, discrete data. Right, so, so motivation is really, we have uh, more, more and more of these infrastructures of computation that allow, for example, to do deep neural networks, but more generally you can, you can see uh, uh, the, the computational aspect of it as having successive basic operations and, and differentiable programming is about having operations that you can compute and of which you can compute the, the gradients, the, the derivatives, so that then you can optimize efficiently over uh, you know, big computers, large amounts of data. Uh, and of course, we've heard a lot about algorithm for, for doing that. And so what I would like to discuss is how can you put in somewhere in these layers, for example, or in some computational graph, operations which are not differentiable, like discrete operations, piecewise constant operations. Uh, so this, you know, the idea to, to extend, uh, let's say, deep neural networks to discrete objects is of course not new. Uh, we use neural networks every day for strings, for example. Uh, there are other applications like for graphs. Uh, there's lots of, of research on, you know, doing neural networks for molecules, for example. And so here the idea is you have as in a graph. How can you uh, create some uh, parameterization of functions that allow to move from a graph uh, to, to a value, for example, and then optimize this uh, using the same infrastructure, computational infrastructure, as the one used for, for the neural networks. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk about graph today. I'm going to talk about permutations, right? Permutations, uh, the mathematical definition is just uh, bijection for the set of integers from 1 to n to itself, okay? Uh, this set is called a, a symmetric group. Uh, I will use notation sigma for uh, the permutation, where by convention I, I, you know, I define sigma of i as the rank uh, of item i. So imagine that you have a, a, a list of items and items, then the permutation is a way to, to, to encode, for example, a ranking of these items by preference, for example, or by size or by whatever. Uh, and so sigma of i would be the rank of item i. Okay? Uh, there is, of course, a well-known, well-understood structure of the set of permutations. When you have two permutations, you can compose them. Right? You apply one permutation, then a second one, you obtain a new permutation. So this operation is a basic group operation. And so the, the, this is why the set of permutations is called a symmetric group. Uh, and it's a, it's a big group because when you have n, uh, n objects, uh, you have factorial n possible permutations, right? So it scales as n to the n, it's, it's, it's quite large. Here on the left, you see just one uh, representation of, of the set of all permutations with four items. Uh, it's called permutahedron. Uh, but uh, imagine the same, the same description when you have 10 items. Uh, it's, it's a bit harder to plot on, on, this, uh, uh, on this slide because it becomes too big. There are too many objects. Okay, so, so uh, why, you know, why would we care about permutations? There are various reasons. Uh, one, so you know, in the world of data science, for example, one is that sometimes we, we have data which are permutations. Imagine collecting data about preferences of, of uh, you know, people on, on drinks, for example, or on other things. Uh, then directly you can encode what you, you, you ask, what the data you collect naturally are permutations, okay? Uh, then uh, there are other applications where you may want to play with permutations, uh, just to name one of them. Uh, I take the example of images, but uh, there are many other fields where this could be applied. It's when you, you have data which requires some normalization. So for example, just to take the example of images, images uh, imagine you take the image on the, on the left of this, uh, of this slide, or the bottom left. Uh, you know, it's, it's an old image, uh, gray image. Uh, if you want to enhance contrast, one standard way to do that is to do things so there is a method called histogram equalization, for example, where basically you take the image, you look at the histogram of values, you see it's, you know, it uses a lot of middle gray, but not much of dark and, and uh, black and white. So if you just change the histogram of, of colors used on the image, you get the image on the right, right, which has enhanced contrast. And so when you think of what happened between the left and the right, before and after the, the, the thing, uh, you have an image, the information you keep is the relative ordering of pixels by intensity, uh, and what you change is just the value of the pixels. So you could say that if you do this operation, in fact, from the input image, the only information you have kept uh, is a permutation. It's the ordering of the pixels, and so you could do that, but more fundamentally it means that the input 
data here would be a permutation, not really a vector of, of values, right? So you start from a vector of values, transform into permutation, and then in that case, you decide to move back to the space of vectors, but maybe you don't have to do that. You could say this could be the input of my uh, classifier, for example. Well, so these are just two, two motivations uh, on which you, you may want to, to develop machine learning for uh, uh, permutations. Another one which, uh, which is not here is also you have a lot um, sometimes of uh, tasks which uh, can be translated as uh, predicting a permutation or something that you can derive from a permutation. Like if you think of uh, you know, predicting the preferences of someone, uh, you, you, what you need is you have some input descript description of, of some item and the output should be uh, a permutation of a list of, of you know, items that the, you, you predict the, the person would like, for example. It's the same when you, when you, if you've heard of the top K uh, losses, suppose you have a loss function that uh, in a multi-class setting where you say uh, you want to predict just one label, but you just count an error if your prediction is not, so if the true label is not in the top five of your prediction, then again, uh, fundamentally, mathematically, the, you know, you have a vector of predictions and, and the, the loss function depends on the order of, of the true item in the list. All right, so for all these reasons, uh, we would like to be able to, um, to play with permutations. And so in the rest of, of, the, of the talk, I will focus uh, basically on two, uh, two branches of things uh, that, that uh, two questions. One is uh, assuming that you have, let's say, permutations as input. How can you parameterize functions from the set of permutations to real numbers, for example, uh, so things like how do you do a linear model when the input is a permutation, right? It's a discrete space, so how can you define a linear model in that case? Uh, so this will be the first part. I will describe a couple of ideas on how, in a sense, to embed the set of permutations into some vector space on which then you can do a, a learning. Uh, and in the second part of the talk will be a, a bit more challenging, maybe. It's uh, what if uh, you want to see permutations not as the input on which you want to do linear model, but as the output, for example, or as some step in your computational graph, in which case what you would like to have is a, is, is a kind of soft or differentiable uh, sorting operation. Like you have a vector, you would like to, to compute the permutation of, of the order of values and have this in a differentiable way so that you can optimize uh, whatever you want to. All right, so, so let's, let, let's start with the first, uh, first question, which is uh, maybe the simplest, is how, how can you make a linear model of a permutation? When I say linear model, of course, it means that implicitly I, I imagine that a permutation can be represented as a vector in some space, in, in, and then I can, I can do a, a linear model. All right, so we'll focus on that. And so on the question of um, uh, if you want to make a linear model, then it assumes that uh, you are able to map the set, the symmetric group, set of permutations, a sigma, can be mapped to representation. I will use the classical notation in the world of kernels. Uh, we call that the feature map. So phi of sigma would be a way to transform a sigma into a vector and then do, a, uh, uh, do linear models. By the way, I use the word kernel. Uh, kernel, uh, in this context, is an operation defined as the inner product uh, between the feature mappings of two permutations. So the kernel between two permutations, once you define a phi, is uh, defined as the inner product between phi of sigma 1 and phi of sigma 2. Okay, so uh, this is a, obviously an ill-posed uh, question. Like, uh, if, if the question is just how can you present a, a permutation as a vector, any choice is good. Right? You can decide uh, whatever you want. So how can, we, uh, how can we put a bit more constraints on the kind of representations we want to, to generate? Uh, of course, depending on the other problem, you may say, well, uh, if you want to, to do some machine learning, maybe you should encode uh, in phi of sigma some interesting features to solve your problem. Uh, it's very general as common, but it's certainly uh, important. Uh, another one is you want to have efficient algorithms. So, so this is not obvious because, you know, the symmetry group is large. Uh, suppose you have permutations over, like the images, an image has, let's say, uh, a million pixels. So if you replace a million pixel by a permutation over a million number, the size of the symmetry group is roughly a million to the power of a million. So it's uh, maybe some representation would directly lead to computationally complicated uh, problems. So here a question is how can we create an embedding that then leads to efficient algorithms? Uh, so this is a you know, second thing we, we have to, to have in mind. And a third thing which is uh, maybe less, uh, I mean, uh, you may want or you may not want, but I will, I will claim that in many cases you want it, is to be right invariant. So by right invariant, I 
Mathematica just mean that we would like to create a re re representation phi, so any permutation sigma becomes a vector of phi of sigma, and we would like this representation to have the property that when you take any two permutations, sigma 1, sigma 2, imagine you map them as vectors, phi of sigma 1, phi of sigma 2, what you would like to do is that if the two permutations are com composed or so multiplied on the right by a, a common permutation pi, then when you map the obtained two, uh, two permutations, so sigma 1 pi and sigma 2 pi, they would be mapped to two other vectors, but uh, the right invariant imposes that the inner product or the distance between the two is the same after multiplication by pi than before. So why do we want that? And why are we talking of right and not left invariants, for example? Uh, it's just because if you think of a permutation as representing, um, let's say, the preference of someone, you know, I, I define initially sigma as saying that sigma of i uh, is the rank of the ith item, right? And so there is, uh, to, to, to give this definition, I assume that someone decided of some initial ordering of the items, like, you know, for the bottles of wine, someone would say, well, let's call this bottle number one, two, three, four, five, and then you can ask someone, which bottle do you prefer? And the person would say, I prefer number three, okay? Uh, now, if someone else does the same challenge, but decides to initially name the bottle differently, you know, instead of being one, two, three, four, five, it could be uh, shuffled, the question would still be, which one do you prefer? The answer would not be three anymore, it would be the number of the, of the new uh, bottle. And so uh, the, the difference between the two would be the multiplication on the right, right? Multiplication by pi, which would be, pi would be renaming of the initial item. And so when I say you want to be right in variance, what I mean is that if someone decides arbitrarily initially of a different labeling of the items, uh, you would like the geometry that you create over the symmetry group to be preserved, meaning there could be a rotation of all the items, but you don't want, for example, to change the relative distance between two, two, two vectors of preferences just because someone labeled differently the initial item. All right, so this is uh, what we call right invariance. Okay, so uh, let me go straight to two, two examples of uh, possible uh, embeddings, uh, which, uh, which we worked on with some you know, colleagues and students. Uh, so I will present quickly uh, one which we call Sukwan and one which we call uh, uh, Kendall. Um, they are presented here, so bo in both cases, um, the representation of, of a sigma is as a matrix. So matrix is a, is a vector of size n square, okay? Uh, they, they are not fancy, they are very natural, uh, you would see, you, you, they are standard ones. Uh, but I will try to explain you know, why they, they can be interesting and what are the properties, okay? Okay, so Sukwan embedding. Uh, Sukwan embedding is just probably the most obvious representation of a permutation as a, as, a, as a matrix. And in fact, I use the word representation here in the sense of feature mapping. But if, if you've done some algebra, you know, in group, in group theory, we have a notion of represent, group representation, which is a, a representation of objects in a group by a phi of sigma that has a property that phi of sigma 1 multiplied by sigma 2 is equal uh, to phi of sigma 1 multiplied by phi of sigma 2. Right? This is a morphism. So in fact, uh, the, the, this representation here, which, which, is, um, which I put here, is, is the most standard, I would say, uh, representation for a symmetry group called the permutation representation. So it's just the matrix. Uh, it's a binary matrix, pi, uh, such that, uh, so I take the convention that pi, uh, so the ijth entry, so row i and column j is 1. If and only if the item J, so the item is in column, uh, is ranked in position I. So think of the columns as the items, the, the rows as the, the, the ranks, and you just plot one to indicate uh, who is ranked where in your, in your, uh, in your permutation. All right, so if you do that, it means that any sigma is represented as a matrix, so it's, it's indeed a way to represent a sigma as a, as a matrix, so as a vector, and then you can make linear models, for example, over the space of matrices. Uh, this, this representation is right invariant, it's very easy to show. Uh, so it has a property that if you multiply everybody by some arbitrary pi on the right, then all the matrices are changed, but not the inner product between the two, any, any two, um, uh, two sigma. Okay, so, um, you know, why, why not? That, that's one possibility. Just uh, this, this one has an interesting property, which I think, uh, you know, can be used in some application, and this is why uh, what I'm going to try to, 
to, to explain now and why we call that Suquan. Uh, so there is a link with what, you know, this example I, uh, I took as motivation of uh, quintile, uh, quintile normalization. So again, quintile normalization is you have a vector on the left, you replace the vector by the permutation of the, of the pixels, and then you apply a new histogram uh, on the permutation to get a new vector. So when you think of it, uh, in mathematically, this operation can be uh, simply expressed as, taking, as saying you have a, so if, if x is your input vector, from x you compute a permutation, right? Uh, let's call that sigma of x. And then the operation of taking, a, you know, uh, replacing the values uh, by, by, by decreasing intensity is mathematically easily expressed as taking the product of this permutation matrix. So th this matrix would be the matrix uh, that is extracted from your, your input, uh, input uh, uh, vector. You compute this matrix and you multiply this matrix by your target histogram, right? And then you get this transformation from some input image in this case to some output. I take the example of image, but again, this is things which are used, for example, in, in biology. We have a lot of experimental data where we know we have lots of noise in the data, batch effects, etc. And this kind of operation is quite standard in that field to say, to remove some technical artifacts, it's quite common to do this quantile normalization. All right, so quantile normalization is one particular way, use of this representation. Uh, and, and when you do quantile normalization, there's an immediate question, which is, okay, you decide to change the values of your signal, like on your image or your biological data, but what should be your target? Like uh, in this case on the right, I think the decision was that uh, the, the histogram should be flat, should be uniform, and you get this image. Now, if you decide of a different target histogram, you get a different image. So there's a question, how do you choose a good one? Uh, practitioners have recipes for that. They would say you collect a lot of data, you compute the histograms of everybody, and you take the mean histogram, then everybody gets the same histogram. That's one way to do. Uh, in some fields, uh, uniform, I mean, if, if, the, if the range is finite, then uniform distribution is one possibility. Uh, in many applied domain, uh, applied domain, we use the Gaussian distribution as target. So we say, let's Gaussianize the data. So each, is, each data uh, becomes transformed in such a way that the values follow some Gaussian distribution. So everything is possible. And one question is, could we maybe learn uh, or optimize uh, a, a good target distribution? And so interestingly, this is something that comes a bit uh, for free when you, uh, when you decide to, to consider this target uh, histogram as one parameter that you can try to, to play with. So for example, imagine that you want to solve some supervised machine learning problem. So you have uh, in input-output pairs, so x-y pairs. x would be the, the vector that potentially you would like to normalize, and y would be the, 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 the label of that, of that uh, vector. Uh, when, you, when you make you know, standard machine learning um, problems uh, amount to minimizing some empirical risks, so typically you minimize an average of the losses over, um, you know, the, 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 the data, so the X and Y that you have. And so if you decide that, you, you, you know, you first quantile normalize your X and then make a linear model over the transform X, you can write it in a question. Uh, and, and usually we first do that and then we just optimize the parameter of the model that will be applied to the, um, uh, to the transform data. Now, because we are able to write this initial transformation as pi x times f, remember that f was, if I come back here, uh, when f is the target distribution, then the transform data for given x, the, the expression of the transform data is pi sigma of x times f. So if you just uh, replace uh, the transform data by this expression, then you get a new formula where suddenly uh, the, 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 the risk becomes a smooth function, not only over the parameter of your model, so the standard theta, but as well over f, right? And so you can easily differentiate compute gradient. If it's a linear model, uh, you can do a bit more than that. It becomes a linear model over the space of matrices. And so to make you know, this, this story, uh, summarize this story, this means that when uh, it's possible to systematically optimize the transformation you, 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 you apply, instead of, of having a two-step process, first normalize and then train a model, you can jointly normalize and train the model. And it boils down just to a simple, at the end of the day, simple linear model over precisely this Suquan representation. So the representation of a permutation as this permutation matrix.
Right, uh, I don't have uh, killer applications for that, but you know, when we tested that on some simple bench tests, it's possible to show that uh, when you can either uh, play the game of you have images, you quantile normalize them, so you change your histograms, and, you, and your target could be Cauchy, exponential, uniform, Gaussian, so you can change the target thing, or you can just learn it, and without much surprise, you know, if you jointly learn the, the, target, uh, uh, the, the target histogram, uh, as well as the model, then you get some slight improvement in, in accuracy. Uh, maybe what, one interesting byproduct that we did not explore much, but that potentially could be explored, is that uh, you know, if you say I want to change the values of my pixels or my p features uh, in a monotonic way, like I want to have the, you know, the, the dark pixels to be darker after transformation than the light pixels, uh, then it's possible you know, to put various constraints on, on the on the target f, so f would be the values that you give to the pixels, and if you impose, for example, that f is uh, non-decreasing, then very easily you can show that uh, after optimization, f would be piecewise constant. And so uh, if you take just the, the, right, uh, the right column in this, uh, uh, in this slide, then the, at the bottom you see the value of f after optimization over for some you know, problem, in that case the goal was to discriminate probably horses versus plane in some data set, so uninteresting. But still, uh, the optimization gives you this piecewise constant uh, values to assign to the pixels. So this is a way to do uh, quantization, right? Because at the end of the day, you are, in that case, you have four values. So instead of the original image, you have optimized uh, how to do uh, quantization into, into four values of your, of, your, of your pixels in this case. Uh, and, and this process uh, has been done in a fully supervised way in order to optimize the uh, the, the global task, which in this case was classification of images. So maybe there are other you know, opportunities for uh, using such techniques in order to optimize uh, a quantization uh, protocol. Okay, so uh, that, that, you know, that's one, one possibility. So uh, again, called that Suquan, but it's just a, a permutation representation. Uh, this one uh, also has limitations, and one obvious is that if you decide to make linear models over that space, then the set of features is quite poor because uh, you see uh, you have n square features, but a single feature is, is item i ranked at position j, and then you have a weight. And you see it's a bit, uh, maybe some problems are depend on, on this, but maybe some, some other problems do not. So to, to, um, let's go uh, to the next stage, which would be imagine you want to have a, you know, um, learn functions that do not check the rank of a given item, but rather compare items like, we like to, to have a decision function that, that depends on features like, is this item ranked before or after that one? Okay, like a second, second level uh, thing. So one way to, uh, to create such feature is to, is to generate this representation which is plotted on the, on the slide, which we call Kendall, uh, which is again a matrix n by n, where by definition when you have a permutation sigma, uh, you decide that the, the matrix, the entry ij of the matrix is just one if item i is ranked before item j, and zero otherwise. Okay, so there are roughly as many ones as zeros, except for the diagonal, uh, and you get, uh, you get a matrix. Okay, so this matrix, again, has the property that is right invariant, it's easy to check. Um, uh, and it has other properties, in particular, uh, when, you, when, you, when you take two permutations, and you say, okay, I have sigma one, sigma two, I create these two matrices, so there, there are two vectors in n square dimensional uh, Euclidean space. You could ask what is the distance between these two matrices, Euclidean distance, or what is the inner product, this is equivalent. And so when you do that, you recover very easily uh, standard things. Uh, for example, the inner product, when you take sigma and sigma prime, compute these two matrices made in a product, then you can check very easily that because it's binary, it's the sum of you know, ones and ones in the same positions. So it's exactly what's called the number of concordant pairs, meaning number of pairs, ij, which are uh, in the same relative rank in the two permutations. And similarly, when you take the distance between these two vectors, you get the number of discordant pairs, right? So you recover you know, standard things, but in a geometric way. So this means that now if you train, let's say, linear models in that space, that the, you know, the, the kind of things, for example, distances in that space become the, the number of discordant pairs, so you can learn models that depend on this type of information. Uh, an interesting property of this thing as well, uh, even though I'm not sure it's very relevant for the deep learning uh, uh, folks, but at least 
uh, if, if, you know, if you look at this implementation, they live in n square dimensions, but if you just have a, have a kernel algorithm, for example, if you just want to make distances or inner products, then this can be done efficiently because uh, you can easily, sh I mean, it's well known that computing the number of concordant or discordant pairs can be done in n log n operations, this kind of ranking. Uh, so you compute these distances in large, uh, in between n, n square dimensional vectors in n log n operations. Only. Okay, so um, maybe I would skip, uh, skip a bit. Uh, I mean, uh, again, there is no killer application, but we observe that in, in quite a few benchmarks, again, um, for example, these are, this is, I will not detail, but this is, uh, these are results on bioinformatics data where we take gene expression data. It's well known that it's very noisy, so pe people tend, again, to, to do this quantum normalization. We observe really that in such data, the, the, the values you know, the initial value that you obtain from the experiments uh, can be just thrown away. And, and if you just keep the order and either replace the values by quantum optimization or just directly, um, you know, train a model with, for example, the Kendall uh, uh, kernel in that case, uh, you get as, w uh, as good or better uh, performance at the end. So this is just to say that um, this idea of learning over permutation can have impact, I guess, on, on, on the uh, especially on experimental data or data corrupted by noise, which change the values in a monoton monotonic way. Um, small comment for, I don't know if, if it, yeah, I see Arthur is here. So some people are still aware of kernels. So there was a question uh, in, the, in the domain of, of, of kernels, which is that if you have discrete objects which are organized over a graph, so for example, I plotted this, this scaling graph. So this is a representation of all the permutations. And here you connect any two permutations when, when they just differ by uh, an inversion of two consecutive uh, values, then you can connect all the permutations that way. Then there was a question of can you, um, I mean, maybe one way to make a, a, a kernel between permutations is just to take this graph and to take a kernel of a graph, things like a diffusion kernel. Uh, this is doable, but this is super computationally expensive because the, the graph is large and uh, uh, yeah, the graph is large. Uh, it turns out that what I showed is that uh, it's well known that on that graph, when you take two permutations and you just look at the shortest path between the two permutations over that graph, this is exactly the number of discordant pairs up to, up to a factor of two, maybe. Right? So, the, so um, to summarize something, uh, what we have shown is that when you take the shortest path, so the, if, when you define the distance between two permutations as the shortest path distance over that graph, then you get a, a valid kernel, which is not true for in general for graphs, when you have a graph and you take the shortest path, it's not, uh, it's not a Hilbert distance, but on that particular graph it is, and you can be computed in N log N. All right, so um, these were like two examples of representation. Then you, you could say, are there more? I mean, of course, you can imagine more, but for example, are there more right invariant representations that you could, you could, uh, you could look at and maybe develop algorithm uh, uh, from? Uh, I will not go deep in that question, but uh, suffice it to say that, in fact, we know very well exactly the set of all possible representation as vectors, which are right invariant. There is a theorem called Bonner theorem in that case, and so you can show that um, you know all mappings phi which are right invariant can be described through their Fourier transforms. In some, some you know, you need to define the Fourier transform of the symmetric group. This is done, and so you can describe all such uh, such valid embeddings just like for you know, real vectors and, 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 um, and functions that depend uh, only on the, of the difference between two vectors, you can characterize all positive definite kernels. Here we have the same. And so in a sense, the Sukwan and Kendall embeddings, which, which I showed, are just like the two most basic ways to apply this, uh, this theorem. Uh, if you want to you know, create new representation that would include not only individual or pairwise comparisons, but for example, features that, that compare three items, then it's possible to follow the systematic uh, theorem to create such a representation. Then the question is, uh, could be, uh, can you derive algorithms, uh, efficient algorithms, just like uh, we did? It's not clear. All right, so in the remaining time, I will focus on a, on a different problem, uh, again, related to uh, permutations and using similar representation, but which is how to, if it's not the input, but suppose in your computational graph, at some point you have a vector and you would like to rank it, and from this ranking do something. So it could be just at the end to compute the loss, or it could be 
you know, for example, uh, a quantile normalization at some level of your neural network. Like you may have heard of batch normalization. This is super popular. It's a way uh, which is differentiable to normalize some data. But maybe you would like not any corresponds to, you know, centering and scaling a vector. So this is well understood. You can differentiate that. Now suppose you want to do a batch normalization, which is literally a quantile normalization, right? You have some vector of activation. You transform them some way, and then you continue. Uh, how can you make this operation differentiable? Right, so it's not clear because uh, first, uh, you know, you map, so this, this going from a vector to the, the ordering of the feature first maps to a discrete uh, object, permutation, right? Uh, so obviously, uh, it's not differentiable. And also, uh, even if you, um, so it's, it's piecewise constant, right? If you change a little bit your x, then you will not change the permutation. So think of it as a piecewise constant function that maps to a discrete uh, set. So it's really not differentiable. Uh, how can you make it differentiable? Again, I guess there are many ways to do it. I will just present one way to do, which can be generalized probably to many other combinatorial uh, questions uh, or, you know, of the same flavor. So the, the way, uh, the way uh, so by the way, uh, this, this part is joint work with Marco Cuturi and Olivier Teboul, uh, and was presented at NeurIPS uh, recently. So the way we decided to approach the problem was to make a link with uh, optimal transport, right, which is a domain in mathematics that, that, that's about how, how can you move some masses to some other masses. Um, there are experts of optimal transport in the room. Uh, and so my take on that is just that optimal transport is one op optimization problem, which is a linear optimization problem over a particular polytop, right? So uh, it's written this way, uh, minimize the inner product between P and C. C would be um, a data matrix. So C would be a square matrix that describes the cost. So, sorry, I should say here, I just focus on discrete optimal transport. Suppose you have N points uh, that you need to move to N uh, locations. Uh, to parameterize the problem, you need to say what is the cost of moving each possible point to each possible location. This is the cost matrix. And then the optimal transport problem is to decide uh, where goes each point. Okay? Uh, and so this can be formulated as, as finding a permutation matrix uh, that minimizes the total cost. So uh, this translates into the inner product between a permutation matrix and uh, a matrix of cost. Okay, and so, uh, so this is, a, of course, again, a discrete problem, but optimal transport does the exact relaxation to say uh, all the permutation matrix, when you see them as points in R square, you can take the convex hull of this permutation matrix, it's called the Birkhoff polytop, uh, and then you can rephrase optimal transport as just a linear optimization problem, uh, because you, you optimize, you minimize the linear function over uh, a polytop, which is complicated because it has factorial n uh, vertices, but still uh, uh, it exists. Right, so this is the, the definition of optimal transport. What's the link between this and, um, and, uh, and, and our problem of, of permutation? Well, there is a link, which is that if you're, um, if you're in one dimension, optimal transport becomes very simple. Uh, so one dimension is literally the picture that's on the, on, the, on the top of the slide, is you have some distribution. So in our case, it would be a set of points in 1D that you want to move to, to n, n locations in 1D, right? And so there is a, a theorem. This is not a new theorem. I, I just didn't find uh, when I made the slide the reference, but it's a classical result uh, that tell you that if you have some weak you know, uh, condition on the cost, so the cost here would be how much does it cost to move from one position in R to another position. So if the cost is a function of the, you know, of the two positions, which, which has uh, strictly positive, uh, Second, uh, second derivative with respect to x and, and y, then you can show that the optimal way, you know, without surprise, the optimal way to move your points to your location is just to move, to go from left to right. And say the leftmost point goes to the leftmost uh, position, the second one goes to the second uh, leftmost position, etc. Okay? Uh, this statement, I just translated it as saying that when you say I minimize my inner product between a permutation matrix pi and the cost matrix, then the solution in this case is exactly the, the permutation matrix of, of your input x. If, uh, if you want to align any, your input vector x to a target vector y that you decide is ordered. For example, for 
uh, you know, you can, so you can decide of, of a target Y, which would be, for example, the entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, until N. So it's a vector of entries. And here I say, if you define the problem of transporting any vector X to this vector 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, N, then the solution is, in a sense, to rank the entries of X and say that the smallest entry goes to 1, the second smallest goes to 2, etc. OK? So it means that the solution is a permutation matrix. OK, so there is a link between uh, optimal transport and ranking. At, at the moment, we didn't solve yet the, the problem of being smooth, differentiable, etc. But here we just borrow, um, you know, there's been a lot of work again in, in recent years on making optimal transport fast and differentiable. In particular, there, is a, there has been some you know, classical paper by Marco Couturier a few years ago that showed that if you regularize your problem uh, in, in, by entropic regularization, meaning that if you still consider optimization over the Birkhoff polytope of your inner product between P and C, but then that you, um, you add a regularization in the form of epsilon times the entropy of, of P, so P, uh, so sorry, here, now P is not anymore a permutation matrix, it's just a, a matrix, n squared dimensional matrix, which is inside of, the, of your polytope, so it's not, you know, the binary permutation will be the vertices of the polytope, now you can be inside, so you have uh, P is a doubly stochastic matrix, um, and so if you regularize, you can show two things. One is that the solution can be efficiently computed much faster than the standard, I mean, not in 1D, but uh, in, in any dimension, it's much faster than the standard uh, optimal transport algorithm. So there is a, a method called synchron iteration that converges quickly to the solution. Um, and second, you can show that the solution you get now is, is differentiable with respect to the input x, right? So Again, here, x would be the vector you want to sort. I said that from x, you can create the matrix C. So C would be the cost to go from each entry x to, to the entries 1, 2, 3, until n. Uh, if the cost is differentiable, then solving that is a, a differentiable function of the cost, and therefore is a differentiable function of x. And additionally, it's not complicated to, to compute the, differ the derivative. OK, so using, using this protocol, you get a differentiable version of sort, meaning that now the sorted, so the, the matrix to represent uh, the, 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 the sorting of X is not binary anymore. It's almost binary, uh, but it becomes continuous and differentiable. Is there a question for now? Yeah. Sorry, which problem? Having n to the power n, like many, many well, yes, so there is still the problem. So there is still the problem that the so this uh, this polytope, the the yeah. Birkhoff polytope, still is very complicated, right? But here, optimizing over it is simple. Um, okay, so in principle, this gives you a, a, a soft, let's say, soft permutation matrix. So it, again, uh, the, the if it was not soft, it would be the permutation matrix which I call the the Suquan, but it's just the, the standard permutation matrix. And here we, we end up with a soft version of it. So instead of being binary, you have uh, entries that vary between 0 and 1. Uh, and it's differentiable with respect to x. So for example, from this matrix, you can recover um, a soft version of, 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 uh, of the ranks. So if, if you know, the ranks, the true rank would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if you take this soft matrix and multiply it by the vector 1 to, until n, you get a vector of ranks which are soft ranks. So instead of being ra rank number two, you may be rank uh, number 2.1 or 2.3, etc. And the same thing, you can have a notion of soft uh, sorted values because if you take your matrix and multiply it by the input data, it's a way to sort your vector. So if instead of the true permutation, you take your soft version, then you get a soft sorted vector, right? So it's a, you, you have the soft permutation matrix, the soft sorted vector, and the soft rank for the same cost in that case. Um, right, so um, that's, that's just an illustration on the slide of, of what you get. So, you know, there is this epsilon that controls how smooth you are. So epsilon was the entropic regularization. When epsilon is equal to zero, you recover the exact initial problem. So you do the exact sort, rank, etc. And when you increase epsilon, then suddenly you, you start uh, changing the, the values. Uh, for example, in the, in the middle plot here, you see uh, as a function of epsilon, so from zero on the left, or very small to large values, what, what are the ranks, right? So, so you have a vector, you compute the ranks. 
So when you don't regularize the range state value 0, 1, 2, 3, until 9 in this case, you have 10 entries. And when you increase epsilon, you see that the ranks, uh, if you increase a lot, uh, the solution will be that everybody has the same rank uh, because the entropic regularization pushes you in, inside of the, of, the, of, the, of the polytop. But in between, you have a, a you know, continuum of weights which are not exactly 1, 2, uh, until n. Okay, um, last comment, uh, I, I'm, you know, I talked about uh, full ranking, but in fact the same, the same ID can be applied if you're not interested in, in ranking the full vectors, but if you're interested in, in quantize or the, you know, the, or the median value, or if you want to, uh, uh, you know, to separate your vectors into the top 5% and the bottom 95%, there, there is a, a, a nice way to express that as well in terms of optimal transport. In that case, you would transports your n data not to n points but to just two or three points and that, that provides a systematic way also to extract for example the top k entries in the vector which then could be used for example in the loss function that, that you know, takes the top k entries and check if the good, uh, uh, good label is there. Right, so uh, you know we implemented that if you're interested the code is available uh, and, and Again, we don't have a killer application to show, but uh, on many tests like uh, top K losses or uh, learning to sort, for example, we obtain promising results, but much remains to be done. So I'll stop here. Um, again, I, uh, the, the summary of the talk is I just wanted to share with you some you know, ideas and, and, and techniques to, to play with this permutation. I think there's a broader picture of um, working with discrete objects, combinatorial objects. How do you, um, you know, increase the, the number of operations that we can put in these computational graphs, meaning how can you make differentiable versions of sorting, of maybe a logical decision, these kind of things. Um, what we presented as formulating your discrete problem as a solution of a continuous problem, then regularizing seems to be a you know, systematic way to create such, uh, such smooth and differentiable versions. So I guess there's much more to be uh, explored in that, in that field. Thank you very much.